So we're going to continue this week. For the next few weeks we'll be talking and studying the book of First John. But the perspective we're coming out of is, is from, um, thank you, Minister Evan, is, is from the, the Garden of Eden perspective. First John is a wonderful book, and actually I don't think there's a better book on love, even though 1 Corinthians talks about charity, and there's a lot of scriptures that talk about love, the whole Bible is about love. 1 John really teaches you love, the concept of love in a way that is, I don't think, like any other book. And it's a very short book, small book, five chapters. But a lot of times we read a book like 1 John, and we don't understand the principles that set up that that, that place of love. And those principles are what I want to focus on in the next couple of weeks. I'm so thankful for you all being here today. Let me stop before I start crying. God is good, amen? amen. He has blessed us and he's going to continue to bless us. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what troubles are coming down the pipeline. I don't care who your enemies are that are standing against you. I don't care what arrows, guns, bows, rocks they have. God is for you. So who cares what the devil has plot and put against you or has it ready to attack you? But today we're going to look at the second part of this and I'm going to t talk about four things today and I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. Um, today we're going to focus more on from the Garden of Eden perspective now. Remember we tied last week Adam with Jesus Christ. Y'all remember that? Good. We tied Adam with Jesus Christ and that's what John intended for you to understand. He's telling you the big picture. There was a first Adam and that's undisputable and that is a fact. There was a first Adam now we have another Adam, which the Bible calls the last Adam. How do these two compare to one another? And that's what we have to look at. The Garden of Eden is a big clue to how we look at these Adams. Okay? And I know you all know the story of Garden of Eden. You know Adam was kicked out. The first Adam was kicked out. But you may not understand where the Garden of Eden is, what it's doing now, and who's in charge of the Garden today. Somebody might say, I don't even know where the Garden of Eden is. We can't get back there. It's lost. Um, some people believe God is, is visibly, it is on the planet, but God has locked it and it's a lost place. It's a lost place. How man gets back to it in the natural um, is probably not going to happen until Jesus opens the door for everyone. But at this point, the only way to get back to the garden is spiritually. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But today we want to look at redemption. A redemption that was never meant to be. God never intended, I'll put it this way, and I'll say this also, he always planned redemption before Adam ever fell, Maria. He planned redemption for man, but it was never his first intention that he would ever have to redeem man. He made man in full confidence that, well, I won't say full confidence, but he made man with the full intention that man could accomplish his purpose if he would simply stay in fellowship with God. God understood that. If man can be stay in fellowship with me, I got this. Man doesn't have to worry about it. I've anointed him. I've created him. I've placed him in the garden. Everything man had going for him had, it was God. Had God written all over it. So God said, if I'm with you, I'm more than the world against you. As long as man stays in fellowship, God had no doubt everything would be fine for Adam. And that's the problem. Um, I need to explain this very, very vital truth. It wasn't God's will that Adam fall. God had purpose, uh, mankind, to fulfill his purpose, to fulfill his will in taking care of the garden. God anointed him, raised him up, put it, placed him there, and designed him to fulfill that very purpose. Um, protecting the garden from any wickedness, any wicked thought. Remember, there was wickedness in the garden, even with Adam present, in his right place. The serpent was there. And I have no doubt there were other demons, other spirits, other things that were there trying to install a new way, an evil way, around God's way. So Adam's purpose was to keep righteousness and keep wickedness out and righteousness in. Adam was supposed to take care of God's purpose, God's will in the earth, and this is where we have the problem. Um, then God ultimately would manifest himself through Adam, and, and, and remember God placed the fruit, the garden of the tree of life in the middle of the garden. Adam was free to walk to the tree, pull from the tree, eat from the tree. What did he eat? And that's a question. I'm not going to be able to answer it on 100%. I know this thought goes a lot deeper than what I'm going to give you today. But I want you to consider something. Without that tree, Adam could not live forever. There would be no eternal beings on the earth in the physical
physical realm without that tree. It was that tree, whatever, some people say it was an apple, some people say it was figs. It don't matter what it was. It may be something none of us have ever heard about. But whatever it was they pulled from that tree had God's life in it. The same life that God breathed into man was in that fruit to sustain the physical body of that man. Remember, Adam was different than what Jesus is now. The Bible says when he returns, we'll be trans, we'll be made immortal and we'll be caught up with him and changed in the moment of the twinkle of an eye. And we're going to become something different when we exist with the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam was a physical man like you and I. So what, con what preserved him physically was, was uh, what was in this tree. And every time he bit of that fruit, it was the essence of God himself in that fruit. It was life. And I'm not talking about the kind of life you think you might have now. I got a good job, got money in the bank. We just took, came back from visit, Disneyland vacation with the kids. Everything is good. I'm being promoted to manager. Life is great. And there are seasons in our lives where we're able to sit back and say, life is great. And you may have the nerve to think that that's great. That's the top of life. You have never, your physical man has never truly experienced life until you've experienced God. So I don't care where you are naturally in your life, you have not even come close to understanding what biting that apple, one bite of that apple would do for you. Jesus said, the scripture says, taste and see that, who is, that what is good, that the Lord is good. Just one bite of God, just one bite will change, will rock your world. Pastor, did you say that? Yes, I did. Because I had a nerve to bite it one day. I've taken, I've consumed Jesus. And I, I've got him in my spirit and my life has never been the same since. Now, when I get out of the reality that life is in me and I get into the flesh, oh, it gets harder again. Things get harder. Troubles come. Storms come. Trials come. Problems come. Pains come. Aches come. Brokenness comes. Bills come. Life gets challenging, but your, whatever is externally happening has nothing to do with the life that the Lord placed inside of you. Eternal life. To know that if I leave this earth, I'll be present with my God in heaven. I'll be in fellowship with him, and there is a power that goes with that. If you haven't, if you haven't received the Holy Ghost, you got to get the Holy Ghost. If you have received the Holy Ghost and you are not understanding what that is, what that means, because if you're trying to look at the Holy Ghost in a natural sense, what it does to your body. Ooh, when I go to church, I just kick my leg. I can't help it. Something just be getting me in church. If that's what you think the Holy Ghost is for, you're living way beneath your means. It'll do that for you, Curtis. You'll put a kick in. What, what in the world? I'm feeling good today. Shout all day long. Clap your hands. Cry. The Holy Ghost will do some things to your physical body that your physical body won't be able to understand, but that's not the purpose of the Holy Ghost. The purpose of the Holy Ghost is to condition your soul for its eternal destination. Now, its final place is there to anoint your soul because your soul is incapable with what's in it to enter into the garden. So the Spirit of God comes to prepare you, change you, transform you. Man, in these days that's so hard. I wish there was a time where I was so, Lord, thank you for the invention of television. When I was a kid, especially on Saturday mornings, I love TV. I love movies. But saints, honestly, I think the invention of the television may have been the, the biggest disaster upon the soul of man in the history of the world. Before TV, we actually went out, played, fished, went to the park, found things to do. The rich person down the street might have had a TV that had nothing to do with you because when you went home, you had to eat your supper, clean your bedroom, read a, let dad read to you. And, and, and things were different. Today, the television is transforming every generation that has started watching it. It slowly and systematically has transformed me in certain ways. There are some shows I won't even watch now. I used to watch when I was younger, but I don't want to see many shows that show me a bunch of blood, knives stabbing people and people dying and chaos and destruction. Honestly, I told you about The Walking Dead. Even thinking that those are already dead zombies, I still am like, man, that's some bad stuff. It doesn't edify me. And that has nothing to do with the conditioning, the systematic propaganda that whoever is controlling whatever is placing in your soul every single day. They want you to believe what they want you to believe. And the problem is, half of us are too dumb to believe we're being programmed. So we consume it.
We consume it just like we should be consuming Jesus or the fruit of life. We consume it, their propaganda. We consume it. We believe it's truth. We become programmed. We live our lives, go around it. They say something's right. We say something's right. They say something's wrong. We have the nerve to say something's wrong. Bypassing the word of God the whole time. I really believe that the television is a big problem. I'm not telling you not to have a TV. And I'm not telling you to, to, to turn your TV off. Even That's not what I'm here to do. I'm telling you to beware. Because you're consuming something. You're consuming something. You're eating something every single day. And if it's not the TV, it may be your college professor. It may be your coworkers. It may be the friend you're hanging around. The devil's going to find a way to feed you what he wants you to eat. But God gave you life. And if you can find out how to eat that and you have a regular diet of life, that's why you got to get the Holy Ghost. Every morning, fresh are his mercies. Fresh are the blessings and the grace of the Holy Ghost inside of you. Every morning you wake up and can have an experience with life and Jesus that will set the rest of your day apart. I don't care what comes, you've already had it. I don't care if you don't get nothing to eat at all. Bills aren't paying problems. You have already met and fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost will do for you. It will sustain you in those times of lack. In those times you don't even have the joy to get out of bed. You don't even have the, you're so depressed you don't even know what next, you don't even know what next six months are going to look like. And don't really care. That's a bad place to be. However, I dare say 75% of Americans don't even know or care what six months looks like. They're just trying to get by today. Paycheck by paycheck, day by day. But a saint of God has purpose and understands exactly what six months is going to look like. If I'm on the earth, I know what it's going to look like. And if I'm not on the earth, I know what it's going to look like. I know what it's going to look like in 10 years if I'm on the earth or if I'm not on the earth. I may not know the details, but with Jesus and his purpose with me, I know exactly where I'm going. So, we see this here, and, 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 and Adam uh, received that tree, and, and he was put that life inside of him every day. As long as he ate of that tree, he would have lived forever, forever, just by eating the fruit. Now, with the world filled, and once, once eventually he started having sons, um, they would also become vessels. Adam was a vessel, and he was a vessel to put, for one reason, to put life inside of him every day, put the life of God inside of him. And that's what God designed him for, to eat and to consume the right things. Without consuming the right things, there could be no fellowship with God. Adam had one choice to make. Am I going to eat God's way or am I going to eat my way, which was ultimately man's way, which was ultimately man's creator, man's God's way, or Satan's way. But man didn't think about that at first. He thought because he was once over Satan, he would always be over Satan, or Satan was more inferior to him, never really realizing this serpent in the tree that's compelling me to eat this fruit is one day going to be my master because I owe him and I didn't obey God. See, Adam wasn't thinking that far out, and that's really you have to think about your sins. If I do this thing here, what does this mean? This means that I will become slave and it will become master. I know we're getting way out there, but I just want you to keep that in mind. But the world, if it would have continued, um, Adam would have had children, and their children also would be vessels unto the life of God. This life that God placed in the garden would have belonged to all those that ate it. And that was the purpose of man, to eat that life and to go and replenish the world. Just go out into the world and feed the world that life. Manage this garden. So... Um, then God would manifest himself through Adam, and Adam was meant to, to, to do this. Um, but this is the problem. Adam fell. Adam slipped. Um, he did fulfill his role as a vessel, but ultimately he fulfilled his role as a vessel for Satan's mess, for evil. For the, the Bible describes the tree as the tree of good and evil. We were never supposed to eat that tree. We were only supposed to know good, exist in the place of, of goodness, mercy, righteousness. We were never supposed to know the options of evil. My daughter asked me the other day, why did God make the devil? If we, you know, he doesn't want us to go to the devil, why did God? And that's a, that's a tough question because I've asked myself that same. When I was young, I remember, I remember asking my parents something very similar. Why, if God hates the devil so much, why he make him? And let him get me or, or, you know, tempt me. Why can't he just get rid of him? But this is the purpose. This is the point. Um, the devil has a purpose. The devil has a purpose to destroy everything outside of fellowship with God. 
Because nothing should exist outside the fellowship of God. The only way anything could exist outside the fellowship of God is if it were, if it had the, the, the understanding of good and evil. If it, could, if it could choose between good and evil and understood evil, understood those dark secrets, those wicked things that God never wanted you to be exposed to in the first place. That's why he told you don't eat in the first place. You were never supposed to be inferior to Satan. Never supposed to even worry about the choice of good and evil. Wars. Sex trafficking. I could go on and on and on and on. Kidnapping. Murder. On and on and on. All the destruction. Ezel, Ezel he painted a picture this morning that just blew my mind. But even that, God didn't intend, that wasn't God's original intent. You can't blame God for that. When we are outside of the fellowship, anything can happen to us. You know why? Who controls you? Who owns you? God, no. God is not your God if you're outside of fellowship with him. Satan is your God. He will give you all good things or all bad things. But I'm going to tell you this, Satan never gives you good things. The Bible says when sin has conceived itself, ultimately it leads to death. Satan knows that. He doesn't care about you. So if he's your master today, I feel bad for you. But God can't legally can do nothing because you chose to be out of fellowship with him and enter into fellowship with Satan. You're choosing to feed your vessel, feed yourself with death, not life. Then we come back and ask God. And it's normally because we don't understand. We usually don't understand what we're doing. But then we come back and say, how could you, God? Why would you, God? Where were you, God? And God hears you very clearly. However, his hands are tied. Because you, not only do you stand against him, his law and his word stands against him. So we have to pray that God can some way find a way to redeem me, restore me, and give me the right attitude. It's almost an impossible mission. It is a mission impossible. There is nothing redeemable in a man. Don't even ask me to continue on that. Look at your own life. Your ups, your downs, your betrayals, your lack of uh, trust in God. Just look at your own pattern of life, your selfishness, the things that we do. There is nothing redeemable in man. However, somebody asked the question, what is Jerusalem? And the guy said, nothing. Then the next couple of breaths he stops and he goes, everything. Because it's nothing in itself, but because God has placed a value on it that none of us understand. Even the angels, what is man that you're so mindful of him? What is this man? There's nothing redeemable. I've seen him do some horrible things to his fellow brother. Why? What is he? And God says everything. This is my plan. This is my purpose. God's excited about you, saints. You may not be excited about the one sitting next to you. Just take a look. Look at the person sitting next to you for just a second. Everybody, just look at somebody right next to you. You may not be that excited about them. But God is. God is excited about the one sitting next to you and if we will start seeing that if we can come and start getting his understanding his vision let me move on I'm getting off track but um, um, he ate of the fruit of the tree that God told him not to eat so ultimately he was start he was filled with the wrong thing so redemption is only a remedy for the fall of mankind God only God designed redemption because he ultimately knew man would fall he didn't purpose that that wasn't his purpose when he created Adam, but he knew it because he was God. Now, you might not know it. It's like buying home insurance. You know something could happen. The house could catch on fire. Lightning could hit the house. Your kids could set a fire in the backyard. You know the possibility of your house burning down exists. And you have a big old mortgage on that house. 150 still left. You're paying off. If that house burns down and you don't have insurance on that house, what's going to happen? You just lost $150,000 because the bank's still going to want that money, but you don't have a home anymore. I encourage everybody to have some mortgage insurance. But because you were wise enough to say, you know, the possibility of something happen, and, you know, moves me to buy insurance. And that's kind of, that's not even really how God did it, but that's kind of how I see it. God says, there's a the possibility. But see, God knew, there, God knew what would happen. That's the only difference between me and God. See, I don't know if my house is going to burn down, but I'll buy insurance. God knew it was going to burn down and made an assurance. Okay. So redemption was never intended, but God, in, God had, it, had a backup plan. Before Adam was ever molded or shaped, God planned a backup plan for redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we call Christ. 
Amen. Christ wasn't an eternal son sitting next to God. Christ was the backup plan, the blueprint to redeem man once man fell. It was God's plan to say, I'm going to go down there myself. And I'm going to redeem back unto myself what I've lost. So God has always had your back. He's always had an insurance plan. But the key is Jesus Christ and how we come into fellowship with him. So redemption is only a remedy for mankind. But long before redemption, saints, was necessary, um, God, God, God had a way out for us. So redemption involves another sinless Adam. The first Adam fell. The first Adam sinned. Redemption would require that another Adam would come. And all the descendants of the first Adam, because Adam fell, also fell. They would become worthless, useless. They could no longer go into the garden. And there's not one animal in the garden that would respect Cain or Abel if God didn't help. Before the fall, every animal respected them. After the fall, I won't say they didn't respect them. They were still programmed. But actually, today, we know something has changed. John went to the zoo yesterday. John, did you for a moment have a thought to go jump into the lion's den? You thought about it? Okay, my next question. Did you jump into the lion's den? Nope. Because something has changed from garden time till now. Lions don't care who you are, who you, who you think you are. They don't care. The only thing they respect is the one in fellowship with God. Okay, or God Himself. Okay, and 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 all the creation is out of whack because man was anointed to do something. The animals were confused because in the beginning they were programmed to respect man, but when men fell, it took a few generations for the animals to say, "I'm free. I could bite him, and God ain't gonna be mad at me." It took a few generations because they were still kind of like, "Oh, wait a minute, he would whoop been, whoop me a hundred years ago, but today something's changed." He's, Ah, and then a man jumps up and runs, and, and over time, things have begun to change. And that's because um, something, something happened, and that's what we were looking at. So God would find a way um, to bring out uh, this other sinless Adam. So God himself, the Lord of heaven, we planned it that he would become the next Adam. He himself would become the son. He himself would become the redeemer of all mankind. When we say Jehovah is Savior... Jehovah is God, the one true God. And that's what the name Jesus means, Jehovah saves. The name Jesus, actually the other name he had was Emmanuel, God with us. So when we see Jesus come on the scene, what you're seeing is God's plan of redemption to come and die for you and redeem you back unto himself. What a wonderful plan. But Jesus himself um, planned to head up the new human race. All the new humanity, not the old humanity under Adam, but the new humanity. And since he is the last Adam, God willed him to become, um, um, willed him to become the last Christ. There'd be no more Christ after him. There would be no one else anointed after Jesus to do what Jesus was uh, anointed to do. Um, only Jesus had this particular anointing. John tells us to believe that Jesus is the only head of this new humanity. That's what First John starts to really pound into you. That's why John always says, and we said it last week, believe on the Lord. Confess the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Son of God. Believe, believe, believe. Confess him. Know who your Redeemer is. Call on the name of your Redeemer. John starts telling us over and over why it's important for me to recognize who Jesus is. If I don't recognize who Jesus is, I won't consume him. If I don't consume him, I'll never live. Because the old me, the old Adam in me, is dying. Because no matter how hard I try, I'll never find redemption in Adam. Never. So Jesus was tempted. I want to say this up front. Jesus was tempted like Adam, and, but he would never fail. He would never fail. That's why we have to stick with the one, saints, who never failed. Jesus was tempted, but he never failed. Adam failed. Let's look at the next thing really quick. Fellowship broken. How the fellowship was broken. Adam's fellowship with God, saints, was so real. It was very real in the garden. Um, it was an intimate fellowship. It was a wonderful fellowship, a wonderful communion. Adam walked with God. The Bible said in the cool of the day, he walked with God. It hit the spirit of God, the voice of God was his brother, I mean his father, just a close relationship, a more intimate relationship than anything you have experienced with your children. Adam had that, this, experience, this wonderful relationship. 
and his blessed relationship with his maker was broken the minute he disobeyed God. That's why we always say, obey, obey, obey the Lord. If you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. If you want to worship, worship means to obey. Not to clap your hands real loud and close your eyes and cry in church. That's not worship. Worship is obeying the word of God. The word of God is the body of God. The body of Christ. Every word in it that he tells you, everything he tells you to do, accept it. Live it. So God, <clears throat> God removed Adam. He thrust him out of the garden. Stripped him of his authority over the world and all of the creatures. And made him a tiller of the soil. Adam went from a king to a gardener in one afternoon. I don't know if it was afternoon. It might have been morning. I don't know. But he went from a king in his kingdom to a gardener by, mid, by, the, by the time the sun went down. He would become a farmer. Not allowed to eat of that tree anymore. So meaning he would eventually die. He would work under the hot sun, never getting rejuvenated, Chris. See, the minute he ate, I don't care how hard he worked or what he did that day, the minute he ate the fruit, his body was completely restored to 100%. And he would have eternal youth forever. Once he was removed out of the garden, he could no longer eat. So whatever that day's work did to his body, Curtis, he was going to go to bed with a hurt back. Can't take the pill, can't take the fruit anymore and get healed. He would go to bed with a hurt leg. Hot sun, you know, burning his forehead. Sunburned, tired. And those days started adding up and Adam started realizing, I'm degenerating. I'm decreasing. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming, I'm dying. He started to understand this concept. It didn't hit him all at once, but he eventually understood. Because I'm not able to eat of that tree, now he's desiring that tree more than anything. Didn't care so much when he had the choice to take that fruit over the good and evil fruit. But now he looks back and he says, I want that fruit. It was that fruit all along. The fruit that God put his essence in. Life. I want that fruit. I want that fruit. But now he can't go back. The Bible says that God put two cherubims with flaming swords at the gate of the garden. Adam could never return. You and I, man has been looking for the fountain of youth forever. All throughout history, you've seen people looking for this magical way to live forever. It, well, they'll never find it. Because the only way is through God, who gives life. Amen? Amen? So the fellowship was broken, and he was cast from the throne room to the garden. And he was still commanded, the garden he was commanded to keep. But now he doesn't have to keep the garden, but he has to work to sustain himself. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, fellowship with the Father and never disobeyed him one time. Even to his very last breath, Jesus was in fellowship with the Father. Take now my spirit. I commend unto you my spirit. Jesus was talking to God, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Just right to the last moment, Jesus was still in fellowship with his Father. Obeying him and his will for his life all the way to the end. Very different from Adam. That's why we follow the Lord and we don't follow Adam. So Adam was thrust out of his kingdom. Jesus remains king to this day. There's no king. There's no president. There's no world leader, saints, that you should be looking to to save you or redeem you. Every king, every ruler, every president in the world today is looking for a way to bring peace into the world. Can't. There can't be peace into the world because there's not peace in the human heart. Even if the king found a way to bring some kind of political peace to the world... Every individual human heart has the potential to introduce back into the world chaos, misery, death, destruction. One person killed, one person in authority killed will put two nations against each other. I heard in Russia, this is in the last 24 hours, they have an upheaval in the streets of Russia because the head opposition for Putin was murdered. They shot him in the street, he was killed. You've got a, a, a country that's not so much divided half and half because most people in Russia love Putin. But those that were in opposition to keep Putin in check or to balance him without you know, allowing him to become too much of a tyrant were a big set, a big group of people. They had a political power and this man was the leader, was one of their main leaders. To have this man removed, now all his opposition is moved out of the way. Putin has a free reign. People speculate, was he assassinated? Did Putin have him assassinated? Who does his death benefit? Somebody killed him for a reason. Maybe he kissed somebody's wife and he shouldn't have, I don't know. Or maybe, who knows? But what I'm telling you is, governments will go to war against each other because one man is killed. Evil out of the human heart can send this whole world into a chaotic spiral. Do you know that this one crazy person with the capability of pushing a nuclear warhead device 
and setting off a nuclear warhead in the world can send this entire world into oblivion. One evil, the evil in one heart can do that. So I don't care what president promises you peace. I don't care what leader, what king promised you in your flesh preservation. He's lying to you. It will never happen in Adam's, in Adam's kingdom. Adam's kingdom will destroy itself. Um, so Adam was thrust out of the kingdom. And let me read you 1 John um, 1 and 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Ye also have, may have fellowship with us. Jesus is saying. And truly our fellowship is with the Father. Jesus is saying you can have fellowship with me. And my fellowship or our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son Jesus Christ. John lets you know right here. Fellowship is very, very important. John's telling us that he intends um, that we are intended to fellowship with the Father and with each other. That's why when folk don't want to come to church, I always catch a suspicious. I know what it is to be lazy, and I know what it is just to be grown up, to grow up really not understanding the things of God and appreciating and putting God's priority first. I get it, because there have been many times I didn't want to come to church. I don't want to see none of y'all that week. I'm just playing. I'm not, well, maybe I ain't playing. You know how it is. You don't even want to see yourself some days, much less have to go to church. And deal with folk who really don't, I look like they don't really want to be this like. But we put ourselves to the side. And we stand up and we say, this isn't a natural thing. This isn't a carnal or a physical thing. This is a spiritual thing. And I, I have to let, make my spirit get up like the lion that it is. Because God is inside of me. And move this body even when it doesn't want to move. And then when I get here, I have to allow the Lord to bless me however he wants to. Through whoever he wants to. That's what it is to be a Christian, saints. And if we thought that way in the world, man, what kind of wonderful world would it be? But we're selfish by nature. Okay. So, fellowship is important. John wants you to understand it. Let's look really quick. Multiplication. To multiply. God told Adam to multiply and to replenish the earth. Literally, God told him, multiply yourself. God took a piece of Adam. I don't know if somebody says a second rib up from the bottom. I don't know. I heard a serious theologian say that. So, I don't know if the scripture clarifies that. I never really read it. It says a rib. So unless he's reading some extra Jewish documents that are giving more details, I don't know. But all I know is a rib. God took a rib out of Adam, takes that rib and forms it into a woman from his side. Adam was multiplied at that moment. The minute something was taken from Adam and shaped into something else, Adam doubled. Adam multiplied right there. Now it was only a rib taken from Adam so, I don't know how we put them on equal. Actually, I do know. The Bible says it, that, that the woman is a help me. Man is the one that still is control, in charge, but now he has a help me. He's multiplied. And they together represent man, mankind. So, if Eve fought, guess what? <clears throat> Somebody said, oh, stupid Eve. If she hadn't eaten, we'd be okay today. But it wasn't Eve. You have to remember, where did Eve come from? Eve came from Adam. Uh -huh. It was always in Adam to rebel against God. Amen. She, wasn't, she wasn't formed by something else or from the dust like Adam. She came from him. So if she came out of him, it was always her potential to do that. That's why he was so easily able to be persuaded because that wickedness was inside of him. We don't think about that. I remember somebody was saying, trying to go off and just talk about women. And women, this woman. No, it wasn't Eve. If she had been taken from something more superior and excellent, maybe it, she could have resisted. But she was taken from Adam, who was a turkey from the beginning. That's who she was taken from. So, it wasn't, it wasn't Eve's fault. It was Adam's fault. Oh, disobedience and sin came from Adam. And that, that's why it's so strange when I see the Lord question Adam. Adam says, this woman that you have given me, she ate of the tree and told me to eat. He's trying to pass the blame to God himself. And God is probably looking at him like, this is you, man. And let me move on. I'm not one of those guys who, who think Eve was wrong. Adam was wrong. Adam was the one left in charge. Adam was the one given the command to multiply. God started the multiplication from himself and multiplied him. Now we have um, this multiplication continuing through Adam and Adam's wife. 
and their children being born. Every person on the earth, saints, um, would be the same material made from the same thing Adam was made from. And God didn't make Eve um, from the dust. Like I say, he could have formed her separately and made another dust woman and breathed into her and made them like each other. They're the same thing, kind of, but not the same. You understand what I'm saying? But he didn't do that. He took her from him, multiplying him. And every child that's born from them is multiplying who? Adam. You and I are a multiplication to what exponent, to what, um, oh yeah, whatever deal, well, to whatever degree, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, but we're being multiplied exponentially every single day. Um, and, but we're all being multiplied from Adam. She was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. That's what man and woman are on the earth today. So when you see a man beating or slapping down or hurting a woman or abusing a woman, he's doing it to himself. And then he has the nerve to think he's separated from that. But one way or another, it will come back to hurt him. Whether it's society is so corrupt and messed up, for whatever reason, it will always come back to hurt him. Because he's hurting himself. Treat her as you'd want to be treated, as, as yourself. We don't see that. We separate. Sometimes we have competition between man and wife and different nations. This stuff is foolishness. Don't get caught on this trap. We are to love mankind, period. So she was a result of Adam having been multiplied as the word of God commanded them. All the children after her are going to be born of a woman, but begotten by a man. Begotten of man. Adam. This is Adam's multiplication. Today they say the statistic I think says that there's 135 million children born every year. That would be about 370,000 babies born a day. That's a lot of babies. 370,000 a day. Adam is being multiplied. Adam is still being multiplied exponentially greater and greater every single year. But Jesus Christ also shows us the same principle in himself. Listen very clearly here. He took the bread. The Bible says that bread represented his flesh. He took the bread and, and he broke it and he multiplied it. Okay? And, and remember the parable that talks about the little boy who had five fish and two loaves of bread? They fed 5,000, not including women and children. From two loaves of bread, Jesus prayed for it, received it, prayed for it, broke it, and distributed it. From two loaves of bread he was able to feed 5,000 showing you how powerful his plan of multiplication is with two he could feed 5,000 actually he did the same thing with five he fed 10 he's done that miracle several times but it was to show what ultimately he would plan to do with his own flesh the exponential growth or rate of growth or the multiplication of Jesus the same principle that applied for Adam would spiritually apply with um, Jesus so 5,000 were fed from the same loaves. In the upper room, though, at the Last Supper, do you remember that Jesus takes the bread, he blesses it, and he passes it to the 12 around him. Very significant. And he says, this is the bread of life. The bread of his flesh. He tells them that. And he, he, te he, he tells them to eat of it. He also tells them about the bud, but we're going to focus on the bread right now. He tells them to eat this bread. The minute they took the bread in obedience to the Lord, in obedience to faith, I believe at this point, they may not have fully understood, but I believe at this point, most of them in the room, and it's, I can't say I'm, most of them because I don't think, I don't know what was up with Judas. I really don't know what was up with Judas. I hope I never do. That, I, I feel that's, that's between God. I'm not even putting my lips on it. But the betrayal that Judas did, I don't know if he truly understood. That's why I'm so fearful that you and I might not understand here today in 2015, in the month of March. I don't know if we truly understand who Jesus is. Because if you don't really understand who he is, the likeliness or the likeness of you betraying him is so much greater. Did Judas know who, that he was the bread, the life? He was the same thing that was in the garden that gave Adam eternal life? Did Judas understand that? Because if Judas understood that, would he have ever done what he did for some money? And a lot of people say 30 pieces of silver, and they're like, eh, back in those days, 30 pieces of silver was about $16,000. 25, I'm sorry, $25,000 based on today's rates. 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed the Lord. That's why a lack of knowledge is so detrimental. The Bible says my people perish because they don't understand, they don't know. This lack of knowledge exists. So, um, 
he, he, he passes the bread out among them. And when all the disciples ate their bread, um, we get a picture here of, of how the Lord intends to multiply himself. Together, saints, they made up the body because the one loaf of bread was passed among the twelve. Together, they'll, if we could take all the food, spit that back up, and get all the bread back up out of them, we would have that same loaf. But because, <laughs> that sounds gross, but because they consumed it, each of them consumed it, it's, it's there, but it exists in them. So the only way to have unity, the only way to have the wholeness, is to have them now who are filled with Jesus. Now this is just the example. The Lord's Supper is an example of what he's going to do. But when all of them together were filled with him, then you could say the loaf is present. The full body of Christ is present. But as long as one of them were at the market and ten of them were here, you don't have the fullness because one of them's over there. That's why the Bible says he'll leave 99 to go get the one. Because without the one, saints, we are not whole. It's important that I care and I pray and I'm, I'm, I'm very diligent in prayer about the devil taking our family from us. Killing us. Causing us to walk away. Turn our back on God. That's how important it is for me to have fellowship with you. Because if one of you who has consumed Christ is gone... The whole body, we have a problem. So, um, this is some things I just want you to think about. This is what we have to understand. So, in the upper room, let me let me let me back up really quick. Or actually, I'm gonna go forward just a little bit. Um, okay, our purpose and our duty. Good, I said that. So, Adam is a broken, and Adam is a fragmented kingdom. I said that earlier, but I want you to really think about it. Adam is broken. He's being multiplied, but his multiplications are going into their clans and their sects and their prejudices. And they're, they're separating, dividing themselves. There's division. There can be division in the household of four. There's a big division. Cain killed his brother Abel. Right there, we have a division. Adam is a fragmented kingdom. The Bible is very clear to tell us a kingdom that's divided amongst itself will never stand. But a kingdom that's whole and together will stand. I can't afford to let you fall if I can do something about it. God can't afford it. He's not going to. His eyes are always upon you. But since he's in me and my purpose now is to make sure I'm connected. That's why it's hard for me, saints, to hear you say, ah, I can have church at home, pastor. Mm. And I'm not saying you can't and praise God at home. But what I'm saying is, what are you going to do about your responsibility to the fellowship? We have a responsibility to the fellowship. To hold each other up. I was watching, a, what movie was that? We went to go watch McFarland yesterday. It's about a small little town. It's kind of like Somerton. But eventually the high school produces, out of four, in a 14-year period, nine championship, California State Championship cross-country teams. But the movie in itself was fantastic. But what you see in the movie, this family that comes in from another big city into the small town, is just, half the movie, they're just like, what kind of life is this? Everyone's so connected and so close together. There is such a wonderful thing in communities of people. It's a terrible thing to be separated and divided. But it's a wonderful thing to eat together, laugh together, play together, work together, support each other. That's something that I think we lose as our cities get bigger and our communities grow long, larger. When we lose fellowship and we lose community, it gets really rough. So I just wanted to say that. Um, um, really quick, let me look at, but, but Christ's kingdom is a whole unified kingdom. The Bible says they were all together in one place with what? One mind on one accord. Not on the cord. They were with one accord. We have to come together. Okay, you like that, John? John like that. So, um, so like the woman, the church is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He, Jesus Christ is multiplied. And when you look at me, you're seeing that multiplication. Not only are you seeing that multiplication, you're seeing representation of the king of the garden, the new king of the garden. Who's in charge of the Garden of Eden today? Where is the Garden of Eden? I'll tell you this much. Jesus Christ, and the Bible says he came to preach the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is the Garden of Eden. Spiritually, when Jesus Christ tells us to come to him, Jesus has went in 
taken the fruit of life and brought it to you to eat it. So as long as you come to him to get it, you have it. And he's the king of the garden. He's in charge of the garden today. And the counterparts of the Garden of Eden would be what we call the kingdom of God today. Let thy will be done. See, God spiritually is inviting us. See, the Garden of Eden, I think, was actually a repl replication of his throne room. But God invites us in today to, to sup with him. The last thing I'm going to look at is Adam's sons. And when we look at Adam's sons, we need to look very closely at ourselves if we want to know what our purpose is. And I'll let you go. Give me four or five minutes. Adam's sons. Looking at yourself, what is my purpose today as a son of Adam or as a son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, or of God? If Adam, let's just say if, this is a big if because we know he did and he, would all, he was always going to because that's what he was. But if he had never sinned, his sons Cain and Abel would have received a great responsibility. They would have been charged to do exactly what God chose, chose Adam to do. Adam's authority and Adam's seal as royalty in that garden would have passed to his two sons. Remember, Cain and Abel were born outside the garden. So this is a, a hypothetical scenario that never did exist. Adam fell, was kicked out, then he had children. Cain and Abel had no idea what it meant to be a king. They didn't live in the garden. Every one of us that descended from Adam and Eve were born outside of the garden in death. So none of us ever understood. The only ones that had an idea of what it was like before would be Adam and Eve. But let's just say that Adam never failed, Eve never failed, and they had children in the garden. The responsibility to eat that fruit and be filled with the life of God and disperse it into the garden would have fallen upon Cain and fallen upon his unable. And the responsibility to fulfill that, that duty would have been easy because they would have watched their mother and their father be examples of what it means to stay in fellowship with God. That dad talks to God all the time. So God would have started talking to them and they would have started talking to God. And the example of Adam would have led them into serving God as king of the garden for whatever amount of years they, they were called to do it. Eternal, for eternity. But they could always look at Adam for his example of strength. Now, um, they would also have to keep the relationship with the father. They would also have to keep their relationship with Adam intact because the father and Adam were their lifeline. They break these, any of these fellowships up, they lose. They're out. So it would have been a hard thing. If Adam and Eve hadn't done it, uh, Cynthia, if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen, guess what? Cain or somebody would have fallen eventually. And because the only thing they really had to go on was the example and the exhortation of the ones that were before that God placed over them. Do do this. Serve God. I know you're not in the place me and him are at. I've been around longer. But you will get to that relationship. Serve him faithfully. Take care of the garden. Bring his will into the garden. And the father instructing the sons would have passed it. And if the sons were obedient and not rebellious. That's why rebellion is like witchcraft. If a son did not rebel his, against his father, he would have served the same capacity as his father. So these little children, baby Cain, baby Abel, basically for the rest of their lives would have been serpent bait. Every time the serpent saw these little kids running in the garden, he would have said, I'm going to get them. I can't get Adam and Eve. Their mind's made up. But I'm going to get these. So it was important that these children would have also been taught to have responsible fellowship with the Lord. Teach your children, saints. Teach your children. Not necessarily your natural children, which is important. But you know, you all, most of us, somewhere have spiritual children. That God is using us to nurture them. Mentor them. Be an example of what it means to be in fellowship with them. God is, have, has people, and you may not even know they're watching you, but God has had people watching you for years. Watching you when you fall. Watching you when you're strong. Admiring you. And they wait a couple of weeks until your name's in the paper again. But people are watching you. And you're going to be the only way somebody's going to get out of this, this, this cycle. Um, so follow the word of God. Stand up, grow strong in the word of God. These boys would have done that if they were in the garden, I'm hoping. That would have been what God would have ultimately would desire. Um, to mature and perform their God, manifesting the glory of God um, in the garden, in their bodies. But we all know that didn't come to pass. That's not what happened. Adam sinned. Cain was a murderer, killed his own brother. However, Jesus never failed. Jesus went 33 years of his life perfect perfectly modeling what I'm supposed to be. That little scenario, what would Jesus do? That's exactly it. That's how we should see life. What would Jesus do? 
when your boss cussed you out and fired you. Okay, you now you got to tell you can cuss them back and walk out mad, or you're going to stop for a second and say, what would Jesus do at this moment? First of all, Jesus probably wouldn't have got fired. You did something. You should have said, what would Jesus do before you did what you did? But anyway, modeling his example. Taking on the mind of Christ is so important. Now, um, we in the same sense are Cain and Abel in a spiritual light. Jesus Christ is Adam. He succeeded. Now it's in yours and my hand of what we're to do. He has the anointing. He's still in charge of the garden. Do y'all know Jesus is in charge of the garden? Do you know eternal life belongs to him? If I'm multiplied from him, the Bible says he was pierced in the side and blood and water came out. That's where I'm at. I came from his side. I was baptized in the blood of Jesus Christ. Redeemed by him. Washed by him. Cleansed by him. And I'm nurtured by his word. And I'm nurtured by his people. Very, very important for us to know who we are. And John says this in the first epistle. I'm going to let you go. I'm telling you. Less than a minute. Hang with me. John grew up. He grew up in maturity in God. I think John was the oldest of all the disciples that walked with Jesus. But he grew up and he remained in fellowship to the very end. He remained. He never broke fellowship. He continued in fellowship with, with the Father. And, 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 and understood what it was. And he writes to us, little children, those of us that have been born, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, he writes to us, remain in fellowship. Let me read to you 1 John 1 and 4. It says this, and these things write I unto you, that your joy be full. The only way for joy to be full is for you to be in fellowship with God. John understood that. And a lot of people read the scripture and say, joy be full. Okay, then I need to make sure I'm happy. I got a good husband. Kids acting right. My bills are paid. That's how my joy is going to be full. That's happiness. That's satisfaction. It has nothing to do with joy. What is joy? Joy comes from one place, heaven. The joy of the Lord is the only joy you'll truly ever know on the earth. And the only way to have joy, God's joy, true joy, is to have fellowship with him. So when John says this, this is profound. And I, I guess he assumed most people reading back then would just understand what that joy is. But that joy, your joy may be full. And he understood that your fellowship with God, because he just got through telling you in verse 3 of what fellowship was. And he, so we're tying four to three. He's letting you know fellowship is that joy. So you were meant to be at home in fellowship with the Lord. And therefore, our joy is only fulfilled in fellowship with the Lord and with his body, with the body of Christ. And I'm encouraging you all, keep seeking for God's presence. And it's not in the fancy music or the, the person up here shouting. Minister, Minister Peter's got up here and told you all, did you look at him half crazy? I know. Everybody's not used to loud, exciting praise. You don't know where he's been. You don't know what he's been through. He's got a breakthrough. He's got a liberty in his life he's may have never known before. A liberty that you sit in here for 20 years still may not know. You're still bound by what other people think about you. But you have the same praise. You love the Lord. You want to praise him. But you're still bound because you heard about somebody laughing at you. So you ain't going to get up here and go, Jesus! Like Minister Peters will. Minister Peters ain't bound no more. He not only has the joy of the Lord, he's up here free and liberated. So of course he's going to be a little bit louder than y'all who still care about Adam. And what other Adam was looking at. When you get that freedom in God where you can go out in the street, and I know, don't even play, I know he would go out in the street and scream just like he was screaming here. Remember Brother Louie? Yeah. I'm telling you, you go to Food City, you and Brother Louie will have revival in line. Folk all be behind you and he's just talking about Jesus. Amen. And y'all be having church. Some folk are not inhibited in their praise. They are free. And that's why be careful when you look at people who are excited about God. And it's not for show. He's just happy to praise God. He doesn't care what you think about him. And what a blessed place to be. The fellowship is a safe place. The fellowship is a comfortable place. The fellowship is a blessed place. And I'm encouraging you all to seek it with everything inside of you. Give the Lord a hand praise this morning.